Hey, what's going on? It's John, and it's time for the JMark Cast for Monday, January 17th, 2022. What's going on? How are you, friends and family? Thanks for tuning in again. Appreciate you all. Thank you for listening in. Hope you've had a good week. Uh, hope you liked last week's episode with a bit of an interview with my parents. I had fun talking to them. I didn't uh, prepare for it at all. It kind of just happened naturally, and then... Uh, I think I, afterwards I thought of more specific questions I would have liked to ask them. So maybe I'll definitely have them back on and try it again. But I uh, thought it was a good break from uh, the usual where I just, you know, sit around talking about how I feel like things around me are going crazy and I'm, only, <laughs> I'm the only sane one. <laughs> um, but uh, th- it kind of is that. <laughs> so I'm going to get back to that, I guess, because, you know, everything's... Uh, lockdown again, right? We have shutdowns again. Who could have guessed that? (laughs) You know, it's totally predictable, right? We, I mean, I saw this coming from the end of winter last year. I was like, there's no way this is not happening again, but here we are. But you know what? I'm not even in that bad of a mood because I've been going to jujitsu. My gym is, I'm not going to say where it is, but it's saying they've like uh, had a, an honest conversation with all the members of the gym and those who want to continue training are welcome to come and uh, train like normal, like normal human beings take the proper precautions that we all did beforehand anyway for regular colds <laughs> and other like flus or whatever. whatever. And uh, if you're feeling good and you're pretty sure that you're not sick, you show up and you roll and you get better at defending yourself physically with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, man. That's the shit. I love I love that sport so much. Uh, the more I do it, the more I fall in love with it. It's amazing. I, I suck at it. I suck so bad. It's but it's exactly what I need to teach me how I how much I suck so that I don't get too I don't think too much of myself. <laughs> I I am a beginner at best at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but it just makes me think that I'm a beginner at everything, even in, even the things that I think I know I'm still a beginner at. But yeah, it's been awesome. I've been going twice a week since the start of January and learning some awesome uh, things that I'm now retaining a little bit more, which is, which is great. Uh, so I've learned this move called the Crucifix. Uh, and it's awesome. The best way I had this, <laughs> the best way for describing it that I got for when I was, um, for this move, when I was talking to Carly was, uh, I explained it as a sideways backpack. Like if you're hanging on to someone's back, instead of like hanging on to them, like the normal way where your hands go around the shoulders and legs go around the hips, you kind of flip yourself 90 degrees. Now where your hands go over, like, let's say the left arm and you wrap that arm and then your legs wrap the other arm. Uh, and then you're kind of like have the person in this X position. So that's why it's called the crucifix, obviously. And then from there, you can kind of spread the person apart and do like an arm bar. You can do well, a Kimura, a bunch of other things to finish the fight. So that was pretty, pretty dope learning that. And I've actually, actually been applying it when we do like free rolls against my opponents and it's kind of cool because i mean i've learned this basically with these people so they know what i'm doing they <laughs> but i'm still able to you know figure out how to execute it with the not with their knowledge that i'm going to be attacking <laughs> something that they learned alongside me you know so it's it's cool the, the jiu-jitsu names are so funny that like, they all sound like super like cool and dangerous like we got the crucifix of course and then the other one that we learned recently was the guillotine right (laughs) the guillotine is such a iconic image in my mind of the french revolution because that's uh right that's the i think i I don't know maybe that's kind of what i learned in history class in high school or something right like we had marie antoinette uh, kind of making the people angry and telling them to let them eat cake, right? Like as if everyone was uh, poor and didn't have uh, money to go around and she's like, or bread to go around. So she's like, well, we still don't have bread, let them eat cake. And that was kind of like the final <laughs> nail in the coffin for that uh, monarchy. And they were all hung, right? The the monarch, the kings, especially Marie Antoinette, I, I believe. I, I could be wrong on this, <laughs> but at least some people in France during the French Revolution were <laughs> uh, had got their heads cut off with a guillotine. 
<laughs> and now we use that word as a move in Brazilian jiu-jitsu <laughs> to describe a, a, a move where it kind of feels like your head's getting cut off because you basically uh, twist your wrist around the neck in such a way that like the thumb side presses right against the neck and cuts blood flow <laughs> and uh yeah it's uh, it's not it's not pretty <laughs> it sucks getting it done to you i usually tap like if the person's got it nice and tight i'll tap right away if it doesn't have it tight i'll like let him readjust first <laughs> before i uh, let him squeeze because a lot of times they'll just squeeze for no reason and you can still kind of uh, breathe just fine it's just like a bit of discomfort from the squeeze of course but uh, they're not they don't have it in the right position so uh, it's hard to even describe how to get to the right position with just words actually now that i think about it but anyway this is cool cool jujitsu <laughs> submission moves that <laughs> i've been learning and it's and it's awesome and i've been applying it too so it's it's great Love it. Love getting back into jujitsu. Love the fact that my gym doesn't care about the stupid lockdown and is just letting people be adults and make their own decisions. All right? And that's what we need. We need more adults living their lives like they know that someday they're going to die. And it's okay for that to happen. You know, we all, life is inherently dangerous. There's a risk to life. And while we have, you know, different tolerances, risk tolerances, it's like I said, inherent to life that we have to face these risks and we need to make a proper analysis, cost benefit analysis on how safety precautions we take are affecting our entire lives. We can't just look at the, how much they're, you know, saving us or whatever, protecting us. What are the downstream effects of the negative consequences? That's what we need to look at. And there's, there's many, but I'm not going to get into that. What I do want to get into is that, you know, we don't need to live in fear. We just need to live in um, a state of taking the right measures appropriate for the situation. It's been two years now and we, we know what we're facing, I feel like. So why are we still playing this, these charades? Why are we still wearing masks in, in, uh, in grocery stores or in any, anywhere, right? Why are we wearing, wearing these stupid cloth masks? Why are we, why is Quebec now forcing a third booster as a mandatory or else you don't have your Vax pass and you can't do all the things that the unvaccinated that never got double vaccinated couldn't do already? Why is that happening? Right? It doesn't make sense. It's all just fear-driven through media, right? Through CBC, through whatever mainstream media you're consuming. It's all fear-driven. And it's totally unnecessary. And they're just doing this to make people feel like they're in a crisis. And then when there's a crisis, of course, extraordinary measures need to be, be taken. And then in order to take these extraordinary measures, we need to give more power to the politicians. That's all it is. It's just a game of power. So, and they're losing power. That's the thing, right? I don't know if you guys seen the statistics, but like basically all these mainstream news outlets in the States, like CNBC and whatnot, they're losing a huge majority of their viewership, like close, close to 90%. And all these viewers are going to alternative media, right? Like, of course, everyone knows Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's like number one. There's millions and tens of millions of people like watching his, his stuff, consuming his media, which is crazy. And now, of course, the stupid public uh, media companies that are trying to control the narrative are, are getting upset that, you know, they're losing control. And I don't know if you guys heard this week, they're trying to like basically shut down Joe Rogan again. Oh, you can't like, you got to put warning labels on his, on his media. Not anyone can just consume it like a warning label of misinformation. It's like, get out of here. Okay. You guys are the ones that are misinforming everybody and driving fear into everybody. And then resulting in these crazy, crazy, I don't know, mandates that are coming out and the situation that people are in where they're like, fighting each other instead of uniting one another with one another to uh, get rid of the the politicians that got us into this mess right like the pandemic 
happened, right? But it was a response to the pandemic that resulted in the situation that we're in now, in my opinion. This is how I see it. This is how I see it. You probably disagree. If you do, let me know. Hit me up on Twitter, Instagram at jmartfit. You can email me, newsletter at jmartfit.com. Get in touch. If you disagree, let's talk about it. I'm happy to have a civil conversation, a dialogue, right? I'm, I'm pro spe- free speech. I'm a free speech radicalist, maximalist. I, I'm always f- for uh, uh, more, more speech than less speech. So if you disagree with me, let's see how we can have dialogue to see what things we can agree on, where is our common understanding, and then which edges. Usually it's like the center of understanding of one another and then edges of disagreement. So let's, it's good to um, just clear that up as much as possible. So let's do it. Let's do it. All right, we're going to get to the part of the podcast now where I'm going to discuss something where I might potentially get censored and kicked off of YouTube for. Let's see. Let's see what happens. I'm going to talk about this girl named Maddie DeGarry. You guys heard of this girl? Um, I'm not exactly 100% sure exactly how to uh, pronounce the name, but it's Maddie, M-A-D-D-I-E, and then D-E, and then G-A-R-A-Y, if you want to look her up. But Maddie DeGarry is this... um, young girl who participated in the uh, Pfizer study for children 12 to 15. So at the time of the trial, Maddie was 12 and she enrolled in the Pfizer clinical trials and she received her second dose on January 20th, 2021. So apparently Maddie felt pain at the injection site immediately after receiving the second dose. So that's pretty common, no, nothing abnormal there. But over the sub- subsequent 24 hours, she developed severe abdominal and chest pain, shocks running through her neck and spine, and extreme pain in fingers and toes. Now, over the course of the next two and a half months, these symptoms progressively worsened, and then Maddie developed a host of additional symptoms, which ultimately resulted in her requiring a wheelchair and a nasal feeding tube. Uh, It also says here, in between January and June of 2021, Maddie had been admitted to the ER nine times for a total of two months. So there you go. This girl was in this clinical trial for 12 to 15 year olds, which I think had something like um, 1,131 people. So actually it had 2,260 people total, but they divided it up between a control group who received the placebo and then the group that actually received the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. And then so it was basically 1131 who received the vaccine, 1129 who got the placebo. Now, this is crazy because in the results that Pfizer published, they make no mention of this girl whatsoever, right? So here's what they actually wrote. There were no vaccine-related serious adverse events and few overall severe adverse events. I think this this girl was basically proclaimed as a stomach ache. That was that was how she was actually um, categorized in the in the results. Like, would you say that's not misrepresenting the results of the trial? Don't parents of children age fifteen and younger have the right to know that in this trial of? 1,131 people who received the vaccine, one of those people has had basically life-altering injuries from it. This is crazy that, like, this wasn't reported, and then, uh, I don't know, it's like this information is being not widely distributed. Uh, I don't don't know why. I mean, I I have some suspicions, but... (laughs) Is it possibly because if people knew that they had like a one in a thousand chance of this happening to their child, that like maybe they'd think twice about giving it to them, given the fact that I think the chances of uh, children suffering great injury from 
from COVID itself is is a much lower lower risk than that. That's what I'm, I've been led to believe. I could be wrong. Again, reach out. Let me know if I'm wrong. Okay, enough about that. Um, hopefully, talking about that does not get me kicked off of YouTube, but you never know. Let's see. Uh, but Spotify should keep keep it on because that's what happened last time, and that's what I expect. And it seems like Spotify is now like this beacon of free speech because that's where you, Joe Rogan exclusively um, <clears throat> posts his his podcast and you know even though people are always screaming that his uh, he should be censored blah 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 spotify never never actually does anything so yeah and i've never had troubles with them whereas i've had trouble with youtube even though i'm like super small time with like 10 listeners <laughs> somehow it's best to shut down free speech in youtube's eyes anyways i'm not gonna BS about that anymore. Let's talk about El Salvador. Um, I had wanted to talk about this last week, but because I was interviewing my parents, I didn't get a chance to. But in El Salvador, uh, they have released a new like ad campaign targeting uh, their population to uh, like basically combat the risk of uh, COVID by uh, living a healthy lifestyle. So they're basically promoting that people uh, live a healthy lifestyle by being active, getting outside, um, eating well, uh, getting to a, a healthy weight, all this kind of stuff. I mean, so it's it's just an ad campaign, of course, but as you know, people still have to follow through and there has to be some more besides the ad campaign, like actual things that they provide to help people like do this. And if this is serious and they actually go ahead with you know, some more programs that promote that as much as possible. And I think th this is the exact move that should have been done from the start. And it's just sad that like a small country like El Salvador is the one country in the world that's actually proposing this as a mechanism for, for dealing with the pandemic. You know, I... <laughs> Like, let alone the fact that all this money that has been spent during the pandemic, none of it has gone towards increasing hospital capacity, right? <laughs> let alone that fact. Like, none of it has gone to actually increase our ability to, to deal with the sick. Um, but there's been no money spent on trying to get the population healthy. Because why would we want a healthy, strong population that could think for itself, right? <laughs> I'm going to take my tinfoil hat off for a second. Sorry, guys. <laughs> But yeah, it's like El Salvador, a small little country in uh, uh, South America, putting the world to shame. Or is it Central America? It is Central America. Yeah, they're right, right there on the Pacific side of the Central Peace. Um, yeah, so this little country is stepping up and showing the world that they're going to promote their population to get healthy, to deal with this head on. The, in order to travel there, you don't even need any vac vaccination whatsoever. They've dropped all restrictions. They did have them in the beginning, but they've dropped that since. And I actually re heard that Mexico is now joining El Salvador as the second country to drop all COVID vaccine requirements in order to visit the country, which is awesome. Happy to hear that that's happening. Hopefully everybody else follows suit. Here's another thing that's uh, happening in El Salvador that like is dope that I think, you know, I don't understand why other countries don't follow suit. They're basically giving free of charge to anyone who has COVID this uh, box of medicines, basically. Um, I found this on online. There's basically a picture of the box with all the contents inside, and they've got a packet of vitamin D3, zinc, vitamin C. So that's just the... Um, vitamins of course then they've got some drugs too they got acetaminophen they got aspirin and then of course dun, 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 they got ivermectin <laughs> so they got some vitamins some uh, pharmaceuticals then they also have like a little piece of paper with instructions on what to do and so you just take that and it's basically an early treatment kit right you realize you've got COVID. you get this box of goodies you open it up follow the instructions and you treat yourself until you feel better and you, you don't go around spreading it to anybody and you also don't go to the hospital and take up a bed 
and the earlier you treat, the more likely you are you're going to fix it before it get, gets you real sick, right? Like early treatment, guys. <laughs> doesn't take a genius to know that when you're sick, early treatment gives better results than late treatment. <sighs> so, but somehow that's been forgotten, right? Every, any idea of early treatment has been suppressed. It's all about vaccines. I'm going to get off that high horse, guys. Sorry. I'm happy because I have my jujitsu. It doesn't matter what else is happening. I've got my jujitsu. I don't care what's happening. <laughs> Back to El Salvador and their little kit. So yeah, they've got the kit. I think it's awesome. I think every, every other country should follow suit, should have some, some way of providing a treatment kit for you with instructions. Uh, and that way we could get out of this thing fast as soon as possible. That's all I have to say about that. Um, all right. Let's do a quick Bitcoin update, and then I want to. I think I want to play a video, uh, and then I'm going to call it. That that'll be it for for today's episode. Let's do. What block height are we? Block height seven hundred nineteen thousand and eleven. Where what is the price trading at? We got one Bitcoin is trading at forty three thousand two hundred eighty nine dollars. Um. But of course, the, another way to look at it is how many sats will one US dollar buy you? One US dollar will buy you 2,310 Satoshis. Remember, Satoshis are the uh, unit uh, that Bitcoin divides into. One Bitcoin divides into 100 million Satoshis. Um, I'm telling you guys one day, it will be one dollar buys you one Satoshi. So it's obviously... Not a long time coming, but keep that in mind. And maybe I'll do a quick. Um, so a week from a week ago, the price trading now it's it's two percent higher than from a week ago. Let's do a month. From a month, it's seven percent below in a month. From a year, we're up twenty percent. Five years, up five thousand percent all time. Let's not even get into that, but it's it's a large number. <laughs> So just keep all that in mind. And then if you are stacking sats, I recommend if you're in Canada, you use ShakePay. That's my uh, exchange that I use to exchange my fiat Canadian dollars for uh, hard Bitcoin Satoshis. <laughs> uh, I have a referral link. Check that out in the description. And so to finish off today's um, today's podcast, I, I wanted to play a video that this Canadian politician, Pierre Polyev, uh, has posted where he's talking, what is it, at the House of Commons? He's a Canadian politician, and he's talking at the House of Commons, and he's giving a bit of a history lesson on what is money. Uh, I've talked about it a lot already on this podcast, but it's always good to hear different kind of points of view, different voices to get a full 360 view and understanding of what is money. So this guy, I felt like he did a really good job of talking about it, so... We'll just finish off the podcast with him letting us know what he thinks is money. Money, of course, is merely a technology by which we transport value over time and space. And without it, our species would have to consume in the present everything that it produces. Uh, most species do. They have to eat what they kill right away, lest it be stolen or spoiled. Uh, sure, squirrels can squirrel away a little bit. Uh, a good habit the government should learn from. But <laughs> most species have to use it or lose it. We developed a technology that would allow two people who are exchanging things uh, to go ahead with their exchange, even if each did not have the ability to supply the other with something that the other wanted. They could simply use this technology called money in order to transport the value between each other across time and around different geographies. And so over time, money has taken many forms. In uh, one uh, South Pacific island, it was just a ledger carved on scarce, uh, scarce limestone. In some places, it's been beads or seashells. In prisons, they use cigarettes. In school, they used to use candy when I was a kid. 
The, throughout history, it became uh, metal, some precious, some brute. We had gold, we had silver, we had copper. Many different means of translating value across space and time have been used. But politicians have, uh, have found it a nuisance to pay their bills using money with integrity. You know, because back in 1215, Poor old King John was forced by the barons and the commoners to sign this nuisance of a document called the Magna Carta, the Great Charter. And in that document uh, was inscribed the principle that the crown could not tax what the people had not approved. And that principle is still in place here in this parliament today. Government can't spend what we don't vote on. Uh, 800 years later. And you look around and see the beautiful green here. You know where that comes from, of course. It's because that was the, the color of the fields in which King John uh, was made low. And it, that green should remind everyone that the people in the fields who are actually doing the work, they're the ones that produce the money that we spend around here. That might have been a better answer in the committee than uh, a government's broader macroeconomic framework, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I digress. But you see what happened after King John was uh, prevented from going on taxing what uh, people had not approved. He was forced to go back to the commoners to get their permission to take their money. He and his successors would become increasingly uh, um, creative in sourcing the cash that they acquired. Years later, uh, King Henry VIII, who is more famous for clipping off the heads of his subjects decided that he could get his hands on money by clipping coins. He and his regime would clip off the edge of the coin and that way they could melt those edges down and make more coins. And back then it was hard to make coins because it was the British pound which was a pound of silver. And by clipping off a piece, you could melt it down and create more coins, and John could inflate the, the value of, of, of currency in his hands, thereby deflating the value of the wages that his, his peasant class earned. He got even more creative later on, um, and uh, this is how he got his famous nickname. He would actually have his mentors melt down the, the, the British pound, and he would re-mint it, with just a tiny coat of silver around the, uh, the outside of a copper coin. So people would think they were getting a silver coin. Meanwhile, on the inside, what they actually got was copper. The problem is, being the egomaniac that he was, facing outward from the coin, he didn't want a profile shot. He, his face was on the coin, and it stared everyone in the eye when they looked at that coin. But his nose protruded the farthest out, and when it was in people's pockets, it would rub against the inside of the pocket, and the silver would, would scrape off the tip of his nose, meaning that you have a silver coin with a red nose, and thus he got the nickname Old Copper Nose. And every time someone saw that red copper nose, they knew the king had stolen the real value of their money. Throughout time, other politicians have found other creative ways. Uh, um, the, uh, the, um, the dictator Dionysius, uh, who was a Greek dictator in, the, in Syri uh, Syracuse, he actually took all the coins, the one drachma coins, and he stamped them with a two. So all of a sudden, he had twice as much money. Now, I, I hesitate to tell that story in this house because I worry that this prime minister might think that he could do the same. You know, if you run out of money, if, if you run out of money, he'll say, you can always get more. You'll turn loonies to toonies and toonies to fours. That might be the next creative idea uh, by which government could get its hands on money. And throughout uh, the 20th century, we saw uh, this same tactic of cash creation. In, of course, uh, with the fam most famous example was in the early 1920s in Germany. Uh, they had created so many uh, new uh, uh, units of account that inflation ran rapid out of control. You needed to have a wheelbarrow full of cash in order to buy a loaf of bread. And if you got to the bar to try and drink away your inflationary blues, blues you ordered all your beer at the beginning of the night because as the minutes went on, it became more expensive. And uh, of course, uh, we in this part of the world have not been immune to this inflationary disease ourselves. Um, while the... Um, the post-war era 
We inherited monstrous debts fighting the fascists, but governments had hard money from the end of the, ni- the, the, the war until the early 70s. So they bas- we basically operated on an American-led standard whereby you could, con- the, if you had a U.S. greenback, you could exchange it uh, at a rate of $35 per ounce of gold. And in that period, of course, we had an enormous amount of prosperity. The Americans paid off their war debts. Here in Canada, with solid currency, we wrestled the inflationary beast to the ground in the post-war era. We took our record debts that we inherited from the war. We paid them off. We increased the size of the Canadian economy by 300%. And by 1933, we had basically become a debt... uh, 1973, we had basically become a debt-free country. But then what happened in the 1970s? Well, President Nixon wanted to spend on warfare and welfare. Of course, the Americans were bogged down in Vietnam which was costly an enterprise, and President Nixon wanted to keep his popularity at home, so he decided to spend, spend, spend. And in the, the decade that followed 1971, not only did they unleash the American dollar from any particular standard, but they increased the number of U.S. dollars in circulation by 150%, while output only grew by about 39%. In other words, the amount of money grew about four times faster than the amount of underlying output that that money represented. Now, here in Canada, we had Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and he looked down at all the inflation that the U.S. government was creating. They had reached double-digit inflation down there, a total inflationary crisis. The American dollar was devalued on an international basis and, of course, was incapable of buying affordable petroleum on the world market. They liked to blame OPEC, but they took no responsibility for the fact that the unit with which they were buying oil on the international markets was itself devalued. So Trudeau says, he looks down at all the misery in the United States. He looked at how people were lined up at gas stations trying to to, to wait for an hour and a half in order to gas up their cars. He saw the poverty that was overtaking inner city streets. He saw the expanding wealth gap in the United States of America. And what did Pierre Elliott Trudeau say to all that? He said, let's have some of that up here. And so he started printing some money uh, here in Canada and massively increased the money supply uh, with which uh, Canada... I just have the data right here. Between 1971 and 1981, the money supply in Canada grew by over 200%, while GDP only grew in real terms by about 47%. So you can imagine, money is growing in supply at more than four times the rate as the economy is growing. So you have more dollars chasing fewer goods. And what do you get? Inflation. That's right. That is, we learned that, all of us, we learned that in grade school. But apparently some lessons need to be learned and relearned here in this House of Commons. You know what lesson I learned and relearned in grade school was... uh, the story of Weimar Germany and how they basically inflated the Deutschmark to the point that people were taking wheelbarrows of money to go buy bread. That was a an image that was, I don't know, like in my mind from a young age as we learned about that time period. I don't know if that was the same for you, but we learned about this. Like this is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not new. And we should we should we should know this we should keep this in mind and we should keep politicians in check it sounds like uh the original trudeau was not a not a good prime minister and did a lot of harm for his country and the follow up is even worse that i'm i hate politics i'm not into politics i almost never pay attention to politics cuz it never you know affects my life but of course this time it does and now i am starting to like pay attention be active and um raise my voice and this Canadian politician Pierre Poliev is like the only politician that I've heard speak that it sounds like he's not just BSing but he's speaking from the heart and being honest and you can tell this guy's a legit bitcoiner he like he he gets it he understands hard hard money or sound money and he he understands that what we're doing makes no sense whatsoever so 
I don't, you know, I don't really care who you vote for, but make sure you're voting for someone who isn't just a politician who, who speaks like a politician, but, you know, acts um, very viciously, you know, like how Trudeau basically is acting where he's calling non unvaccinated people like uh, misogynists and, and racists. Like, like what, how are you? He's just basically trying to divide people up, right? That's all he's doing. He's dividing people up. I watched this great video of like a, of a father, a young father who was just saying, he's like, he's dividing people up and making us fight each other. Uh, he, he said it way more eloquently. You should go check it out. I don't even know what you <laughs> search to check it out, to be honest. I don't know where I saw it, but it, it was awesome to hear like how, like at least some people understand that like, we don't need to fight each other. If we unite together, we have all the power and like we can end this if we want to. Anyway, thanks guys for listening. Appreciate you all. It's uh, crazy that people listen to this thing at all. And um, I'm going to keep doing it because I like enjoy it. And so have a good day, guys. Be active. Be grateful. Jmart out.